hi everybody and welcome. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation, Hiking in Buena Vista and Salida. I'm Sarah Gorecki and I'm the Director of Publishing at the Colorado Mountain Club. This evening we have CMC Press author Penelope Purdy who will discuss some of the best places for hiking in the upper Arkansas River Valley and show photos from some of the, some of the 25 trails included in her new book. Um, speaking of her new book, this is her new book, uh, The Best Buena Vista and Salida Hikes. And the book will be 20% off during tonight's presentation on our website, cmcpress.org, which I will put in the chat. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with Zoom by now, but here are some friendly Zoom reminders for tonight's presentation. Um, please keep your microphones muted. And please keep your cameras off. That really helps with internet bandwidth. Just as a reminder, this session is being recorded. And please do ask any questions you have in the chat box. Penelope will answer all questions at the end of the talk. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Penelope Purdy is an award-winning journalist who spent much of her career with the Denver Post, where she specialized in reporting about environmental issues including climate change, wildlife conservation, and national forests and parks. An avid outdoors woman, Penelope has completed hiking the Colorado Trail and climbed all of the 14ers in the contiguous 48 states, including Colorado, California, and Washington. She has climbed in the Himalayas, Andes, Canadian Rockies, and Alaska. And she is also the author of Hiking Colorado's Roadless Trails, published by CMC Press. And now over to you, Penelope. Well, thank you everyone for joining me this evening. I'm sure that uh, most of us uh, may know where Buena Vista and Salida are, but here's a map just getting us oriented to, that's Buena Vista, that's Salida. So it's southwest of Denver, almost due uh, west of Colorado Springs. The area is popular because it's close enough to the front range to be accessible, but just far enough away that you lose at least a little bit of the crowd, the day hiking crowds. The um, trails in the book, uh, most of them are day hikes because that's mostly what people do, uh, but they range from very easy half day hikes to uh, a couple of longer backpacks. And I will talk about those in a minute. By the way, the peak that you're looking at dead ahead as you come down uh, from Trout Creek Pass on 285, that's Princeton. And we'll talk about Princeton in a little bit. I'm gonna start with the northernmost access uh, and, and the trails. The uh, Interlochen Historic Resort Trail is about 20 minutes south of Leadville. So you come through, you drop off what is an ancient glacial moraine and you come to the turnoff that will take you over to um, US 82 or Colorado 82 and on over Independence Pass uh, to Aspen, but you don't actually want to go there. What you do is you start on that road, you come down here or up here, coming from the springs, turn uh, west at Ball Town and drop down here. I like this trail for a couple of reasons. One, it's an easy trail for families or perhaps those of us who are just a little bit older. Um, and it's accessible, it's ac accessible year round. In the winter, I suggest that you do take either um, snowshoes or uh, traction devices such as yak tracks. In the meantime, you're gonna get some great views of Twin Lakes and the surrounding Sawatch Range. When you wind up at uh, Interlochen, as I said, it's an old historic area and winter or summer, you're gonna find some nice places to uh, either sit in the sun or find some shade and have a picnic. Because uh, as I said, this is an easier way, one of the easier trails in the book, and it's a good introduction. The two of the other trails that I'm gonna talk about, these are again about 20 minutes south of the trails that we were just talking about. Um, so again, you're moving from, south of Leadville, and now you're driving down US 24 toward Buena Vista. The Clear Creek Trail access is off 24 at 
Clear Creek Reservoir. It's well marked and you come this way and right at Winfield, you're gonna wa wanna park your two wheel drive cars. Real four wheel drive cars, not just uh, AT, um, all terrain vehicles, but real four wheel drive cars can continue up to about here. Now the first, so that is the access. This is well described in the book. The first trail I'm gonna talk about is going to be here. This is Mount Huron. I want you to notice the little squiggly lines. There are 80 billion um, switchbacks on this, but Colorado 14ers initiative, which works on the, a volunteer group that works on the 14ers, did an amazing job of fixing up this trail. Huron, again, it's iconic because you can see it from many of the other trails in the area. Once you cross Timberline, you're gonna come across the, uh, the tundra over here to the left, pass up these, to the left of these cliffs, then go up this shoulder, and that's not exactly the summit, the summit's behind here. One of the things I will emphasize again and again in this talk <clears throat> is if you plan to do any of the hikes above Timberline, you have to be off the summit in the summer by noon because these thunder showers you're used to seeing in the front range hit the high country much, much earlier. And there's no place to hide from the lightning. It's not, you don't worry about getting wet, you get worry about getting hit. So this is, uh, and this, this is a good view of that. Don't try to come up here on any other way. This is just miserable walking. So you wanna stay on the trail, both for environmental reasons and for your own sanity. From the same, uh, trailhead, you start walking due west and toward three high 13ers, collectively known as the Three Apostles. This is North Apostle. This is Ice Mountain, which is one of the most difficult of Colorado's 100 highest peaks, also known as the Centennial Peaks. The hike itself is pretty straightforward. There is one significant stream crossing where there's not a bridge and a hill a very short hill, but um, it's sandy and kind of steep. But once you crest those um, as a day hike, it's pretty straightforward. The climb, however, is um, technical on Ice Mountain. So I would leave the climb to the uh, more experienced mountaineers. Just go up and enjoy the, uh, the day hike and the beautiful uh, little basin here. Most of the time in early summer through about this time of year, the whole basin is filled with various kinds of wildflowers. So it's a great place to go up and see some wildflowers, um, have a picnic. And because there are a lot of flowers and insects and things to eat, you'll also have good birding up in here. The third trail that comes off the Clear Creek Reservoir access road is Lake Anne. It's less visited because it's a longer hike than getting to Lake Ann. It's still a day hike. Some people want to uh, go in and backpack, but don't pat, uh, camp right near the lake. Um, the Forest Service really does not want you camping anywhere up above Timberline here, so camp down in the trees. Lake Ann also is on the way to Lake Ann Pass, which is part of the Continental Divide Trail. The turnoff from the Continental Divide Trail here on the right, um, it's not marked at all. So this is what it looks like. If you go this way, you're headed to, you're on the Continental Divide Trail, headed to Lake Ann Pass, and eventually you're gonna wind up in New Mexico. If you, so take this left-hand turn and Lake, da Lake Ann is down in here. Behind it, you can see how rugged this terrain is and you're looking up and back at the Three Apostles. South, okay, here is Clear Creek Reservoir. Here are the three trails that we just visited. Coming south is this very long and exquisite backpack. This is the Pine Creek drainage. Um, you, the uh, hiking starts very shortly after you leave the highway. And this is a very long nature hike is what this turns into. All right, so we're going to go. The hiking's not hard, it's just 
long and continuously uphill. I consider this to be one of the prettiest hikes in the whole uh, upper Arkansas River Valley. You need to take special care here because this place until recently was not heavily traveled. So pack out all your trash, make sure to bury your own uh, human waste and pick up after your animals, your, your pets, because this area is, I won't say it's pristine, but it's pretty clean and we really want to keep it that way, especially for creatures everywhere from the beaver to the moose. And by the way, the other thing that thrives in these wetlands that the uh, beavers create are butterflies. So you see butterflies and birds and moose and uh, all kinds of crit critters up here. And there's great fishing in these beaver ponds. <clears throat> Pine Creek, if you read the introduction to the book, it talks, I talk a lot about the geology of this area because it's really varied and intriguing. You see the size of this boulder called in a, an erratic. What happened was an ancient, during the ice age, a giant ice dam created by a glacier collapsed suddenly and it unleashed this massive flood that came down Pine Creek uh, into what now is the Arkansas River Channel. In fact, at the Arkansas, where the Arkansas and Pine Creek meet is one of the toughest rapids in the whole, um, that whole stretch of the Arkansas River. But you can, as you were hiking up, you'll see these huge glacier erratics and it gives you a sense of the power and the, the um, rage of that Ice Age flood. It must have been um, biblical in size. You also get a sense of that by when you reach your first uh, goal, which is Bedrock Falls. You clearly can see the um, remnants of the bedrock and the glaci glaciated uh, granite. For many people, just a backpack into Bedrock Falls will be plenty. And uh, there are some uh, great uh, places to camp on the, um, oh, just a second, let me see, it's on the, um, just up this creek side from the place I'm standing toward the, the trees, you're gonna find some pretty good camping um, areas in there. You, <clears throat> you can also reach a couple of the major 14ers or the popular 14ers, I should say, from the Pine Creek Valley. I'm near the um, mouth of the valley here before it drops down into Pine Creek Canyon. On your right is that very long ridge. I want to emphasize that. That's Elkhead Pass right in here. To get up the 14ers, uh, Belford and Oxford, you're going to have to go up this ridge, go back to uh, Belford, come over here and go over to Oxford and then come down. And once again, I want to you to just mentally comprehend how long that is and how long you're going to be above Timberline. Do not try to outrun these storms. If you can outrun a lightning bolt, I'm sure the US Olympic team would love to hear from you. So um, do enjoy yourself up here. The views are great, but it is a very long hike. I suggest taking a backpack. You go in one day, camp, and get up really early the next morning and do the ridges because you don't want to be up there on a summer afternoon in a normal year. Way off here on the right, doop, 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 you're going to see Emerald and Iowa. Off here to our right is Missouri, but I don't discuss that much in the book. There are better ways to get up Missouri that uh, don't cause as much erosion. Again, coming up Emerald and Iowa, you've got, I suggested as a backpack, they're pretty straightforward, but there's no official trail. So read the directions to the trail that I describe in the book very carefully. And meanwhile, just enjoy the spectacular views on your way into the peaks. Now we're moved south all the way to Buena Vista. OK, 
okay? And this is the Whipple Trail Complex. Actually, you will note that there are several trails that connect into the trails I describe in the book. The other, th um, so you can do a very long loop. You can come up and do a short loop. You can come up and do a long loop and then come back down around here. By the way, this side thing on the west side of the river is wheelchair accessible. And you're going to be walking past, oh, brew pubs and coffee houses. So if you go up and do a long hike and want to take a, um, have kind of an enjoyable afternoon, you can just walk down along here. The nice thing about the Whipple Trail Complex, there's two things. One, it's a great place to go hiking when the weather's ba uh, bad in the high country or if you're there in very early or late season. And you still get some spe spectacular views of the um, looking back west to the Sawatch Range and of the historic town itself. North Cottonwood access comes off of a Buena Vista's up in here. And what you're going to do, I'm sorry, Buena Vista's down here. Sorry, this is uh, BV down in here. All right, so you're going to come up and take these roads in. And right here, I'm sorry, right there, right there is where the road um, where you have the two trailheads. If you continue up this way, um, you can get Mount Columbia and Mount Harvard. I didn't put those in the book because that um, Horn Fort Basin, which um, is up in here, is really beautiful, <clears throat> but it is terribly overused as it is. And until um, the Forest Service gets a better handle on reducing the amount of trash and waste that uh, winds up there. Um, and until Colorado 14ers initiative finishes the trail on Mount Columbia, I kind of steer you folks away from Harvard and Columbia just for the time being. If you are doing and finishing your 14ers, of course, this is the easiest way to get up there. It's also the most ecologically sound way. I know some people try to climb Harvard from Pine Creek, but there's no official trail and these people likely end up tromping down the tundra, which is not, which is a very bad thing to do because tundra can take centuries to recover. In any, any case, let's get back on a couple of trails that are uh, well maintained and um, actually very pleasant. So you're going to come here. At some point, the dirt ro this road turns into dirt and this is the access to Harvard Lakes. The first mile or so is a little steep. And after that, you can see that it really mellows. Uh, again, this is a beautiful place. First thing in the, uh, or early in the summer for wildflowers. Here you have a pasque flower, also known as a wild crocus. Uh, and anywhere that you have great flowers, you're likely to have good bird watching. Because of the very terrain headed into Mount Har or into Harvard Lakes, um, you see birds and uh, of all kinds, wildlife, you get some great views of the valley. And by the way, at the lakes themselves, you do find great fishing. This is the upper lake. You need a Colorado license. Please check with the latest uh, information from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, to see if they uh, are requiring catch and release or if you can catch and eat at these various places I talk about fishing. I also want you to note that my dog who loves being in the water is on a leash. The leash protects him as well as protecting the wildlife. Um, once in a while I have to take him off leash when we are going down something steep, but most of the time he's on a leash. And as I said, that's as much for his protection from things like bears and skunks as it is to protect the wildlife. I recommend doing, there's a trail that goes from North Cottonwood Creek across the shoulder of Yale and down to the Avalanche Trailhead, which is on the main Cottonwood Pass Road. Cottonwood Pass is accessed directly out of Buena Vista, and I'll tell you that in a minute. I'll show you that on a map in a minute. I do not recommend doing Yale from this direction. It's longer, and again, you're going off trail, 
which these is it legal? Yes. Is it environmentally uh, sensitive? No, because a lot of these places, there, there's just so many of us in the high country anymore that um, if you go off trail, you stand, uh, we could be doing a lot more damage um, than we think we are. Any case, this is coming down off uh, um, that long piece of the Colorado Trail from North Cottonwood to the Avalanche Trailhead. All right, now this is that trail I was just showing you, North Cottonwood to the Avalanche Trailhead. I do recommend doing it this way because this, you notice, this drops very steeply in almost a straight line. So you go up something gentle, gentle, cross the uh, ridge of uh, Yale, and then come down. I find that much easier. Uh, if you have bad knees, you might want to do that in reverse. But on the other hand, if you have really bad knees, maybe you want to do some of the easier trails in the book. So, excuse uh, me. Oh, my deep apologies, people, sorry. So you do this, come up and drop down here to a shuttle. Note that Buena Vista is right over here and you're coming up here. And now we're gonna talk about a bunch of trails that you can access off this paved Cottonwood Pass road. So two wheel drive vehicles can reach all of these trailheads. Um, even rental cars can get, get in here with, without a problem in late, uh, late spring through the fall. All right, so here we go. This is Denny Creek Trailhead. There used to be several access places for Mount Yale. So many people hiked the mountain that uh, the Forest Service and Colorado 14ers Initiative basically shut down the access on the other trails. So my strong recommendation is that you climb Mount Yale via this route, which is Denny, this is, I sorry, Denny Creek, and then you come up here and then this way. Let's talk about that in a minute. Mount Yale is the easiest of the 14ers I describe in the book, but it is not a beginner's peak. I consider this an intermediate peak. At this point where I'm standing, I'm on the far right-hand side of a boulder field that you have to cross to get up the mountain. Um, so it's time consuming. And once again, it, early start, very much recommended, very much uh, suggest staying on the main trail, which cuts across the mountain. It comes up this boulder field, you'll see the rest of it, cuts across here, goes around the back, goes this way, and that is not the summit. It's very rare for you to be actually be able to see the summit until you're actually almost on it. There's a great line from the poet Cahil Gabron, uh, where Cahil Gabron, where he says that the mountain to the climber is clearer from the plain. And that's very true. Most of the time, what you see on your way up will be a false summit. And that's certainly true here on Yale. This is the boulder field I was talking about. Uh, there are cairns to help you find your way through it. I'm about to make, um, I've considered a class two move, oh, not quite a class three. I used a hand, couple of hands to push up on these rocks. And when I got up there, this marmot was not terribly happy about us being there. This is another reason to stay on the trail. The creatures may not be have their homes right by the trail these days, but you don't want to be disturbing them in their, their dens, especially in an environment as harsh and as demanding as the area, the, the, um, the alpine tundra. But in any case, Yale is still a beautiful mountain. The trail is gorgeous. It's, it's a, almost a work of art. So it's a wonderful mountain for intermediate hikers but it's not a beginner's peak. None of these 14ers are. On the other hand, uh, if you go left at the intersection instead of right, if you go right, you go to Yale, Mount Yale. If you go left, you go to Lake Hartenstein, which is a very doable hike. Um, there's good fishing here, although if you're fly fishing, you have to avoid my bad habit, which is to ca capture every species of weed and willow native to the Rockies. Um, nonetheless, fewer people come up here, uh, so the fishing's better. 
uh, there you also pass through areas of flowers and um, this whole grove of fairly young aspen that are head height to just a little bit above head height. So in the fall, you're walking through this, this, um, this, this tunnel of yellow and gold and, and orange. So it's a great fall hike as well. Notice on the far, you, you used to be able to walk around the lake, clear around the lake, but you can't do that anymore because in the heavy snow year of 2018 and 2019, there was a massive avalanche and it just pulled all this, uh, pushed all this timber down into the lake. So you can't go all the way around. On the other side is, if you keep a close eye out, is where you're gonna see the wild animals because there are no people. As I said, Hardesting is a good place to really take uh, uh, an interest in flowers and the birds, but it also is a hefty reminder of the power of nature. This is what the avalanche did to uh, spruce trees that at least were 200 years old. Uh, I'm doing some uh, counting some rings and you look at the density of the timber in here. This, this tree was probably a couple hundred years old and it snapped it like a toothpick. That's kind of a warning about uh, the reason you need to take an avalanche safety class if you travel in winter. The Colorado Mountain Club does uh, provide such training. And if you go up there in winter, anywhere in the Rockies, you probably should know something about how to avoid avalanche risk. Being out in the winter is great, but know what you're getting into. Finally, Pretty close to Cottonwood Pass is this little gem. It's called Ptarmigan Lake. It's a very popular hike for a couple of reasons. One, it's scenic. And two, it gets you up to this high altitude lake that's just, it's surrounded by the, these, these rugged hills. And then you turn your back on the lake and you look back at uh, the, the Mount Yale area. Um, great fishing. It can be windy sometimes, and a lot of times it's sunny, so you want to take a good sun hat and plenty of sunscreen. Uh, but Ptarmigan Lake is, uh, is, is, requires a little bit of a push right near the end because it sits atop an ancient um, glacial moraine. But along the way, there are other places that you could stop to have picnics or simply enjoy the scenery. These are some of the ponds that are uh, probably old beaver ponds that are on top of or on the way to the lake. So I saw, excuse me, I've seen a number of people stop at these ponds uh, when they didn't think their kids or their grandparents could quite make that last push up to the lake itself. Nonetheless, the trail is, I highly recommend this trail as well. That's why it's in the book. <coughs> you know, I noted earlier that the, as you come over Trout Creek Pass, the peak that you see right ahead of you that's so dominant is Mount Princeton, which is right there. This is mostly a road until you get up high. Here's the thing, this road It is really challenging, and the most challenging parts for a car are low down. If you have a two-wheel drive car, you want to park here, which is at the New Life um, Christian Camp. They do allow uh, public parking. There's a public outhouse, and that's where you want to put your car, leave your car, unless you want to single-handedly put your auto mechanics kids through college. So two wheel drive cars and most all terrain vehicles will wanna stop here. True SUVs can continue, eh, get, yeah, let me get here, okay. Up here, up here, and you're going to go to about here and you're going to, let's see, actually right there, right there. Those are the radio towers. Uh, there's some parking at the towers and just beyond there. Most people choose to park there unless they have an exceptionally ruggedized vehicle. I saw a few trucks push on up and then the people will walk over. But usually you're gonna be, if you have a SUV, you're gonna be hiking from here. 
And again, you're going to get up here. And at that point, there is some camping up here, by the way, just beyond the uh, a few camping spots, just beyond the radio towers. From that point, you're pretty much walking. And this is what you're walking through. Yes, it's beautiful. And one more time, I'm going to tell you that you're exposed because the trail is going to come up either if you get all the way up the road, you're going to cut across here, but most of us are going to do something in here. This, um, and that is, puts you way above Timberline. It is a spectacular view. As a hike, you know, parts of it, once you get off the road, are very nice, like in here, where you see all the wildflowers clinging somehow to an incredibly harsh environment. And the views are stunning. Walking up that road will take as much mental discipline as it does physical strength because it seems to be some sort of an existential uh, curse that you're on this road for so long. But it is one of the iconic peaks in the, the area. If you decide, if you are walking, this is your turnoff. It is not marked. There's a conifer, and then there's a series of uh, the kind of stone steps, and that's going to take you off to the right. Then you don't have to finish hiking all the way up the road. So remember this spot if you're walking the road. I was amazed at how much life still thrives in this very difficult, windblown environment that gets baked by the sun in the summer and frozen in the winter. And yet you have the flowers, you have bees up here. Um, I saw raptors. Of course, you have marmots. You have um, pikas and their little, and their little cries when they, they uh, just before they hide in their rock dens. And of course, you have ptarmigan. You may almost step on these birds before you realize they're there because in the summer they look exactly like the grasses and the dirt and in winter they look exactly like the snow. So if you're lucky you get to see ptarmigan up here. Now also off the Cottonwood Pass Road on the other side of the creek is the narrow gauge trail. It's a little over a mile each way. I suggest parking at the east trail head because then you're not uh, dealing with trying to cross the road uh, with all the uh, RVs careening off the, coming down off the pass. And it gives you some great views of the state wildlife area, which is at the lake. And this is Mount Princeton. This is Princeton. And here are the chalk cliffs. You see several uh, great, great views of the chalk cliffs. It is a good place to take kids. Uh, and it is uh, doable for most people if they're able to step over occasional rocks and do a few, um, about 10 feet of uphill on uh, a bit of a stony uh, area. But it is the narrow gauge trail. Princeton's one of the toughest and the narrow gauge trail is among the easiest in the books, in the book. Once more, we're moving south here, okay? We're still in the BV area. These trails can be com combined. Browns Falls, okay, Browns Falls is in here. The lake is up here and the wagon wheel loop is an alternative that you can do either as its own hike or as a, 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 an alternative way to get off uh, the, the Browns Falls and uh, the lake uh, hike. So it's a day hike to the falls, which um, are wonderfully cool in the, the hot summer days. So in the middle of uh, uh, July, you'll see a lot of people up here. Do take some care walking around these boulders. They can get wet and um, they're sort of polished. You know, rocks that have been uh, eroded by water take on, um, they, they can be very slick on one side and they're actually almost always sloping down toward the water. So take some care there. So anyway, you see a lot of people at the falls. If you push on to the lake, you're gonna lose about three quarters of the crowd. Um, but that requires you to go uphill steadily for another three miles, about another three miles. So I suggest 
camping at the lake and the best campsites at Brown's Lake are on the far side. They're on the western side of the lake. An alternative finish to this is the Wagon Loop uh, Trail, which uh, hooks in in a couple of places to the access road. This is a trail you can do almost year round until the Forest Service, you can't get up the Forest Service Road anymore because of the deep snow. So clear into October, this is a nice place to have a pleasant forest walk with um, a lot of leaves. You're gonna cross a, um, a couple of small streams. The biggest, two biggest problems are going to be mountain bikes and an occasional area where the bikes have eroded the trail. But if you're an experienced hiker, uh, the trail is very doable. And uh, I do suggest using trekking poles on it. I do suggest that for the, uh, the more eroded places. But this is also a good place, by the way, this is one of the best areas to see northern flickers, um, those birds. I saw woodpeckers here, mostly downy woodpeckers, as well as nuthatches. Nuthatches are these little gray and white birds with kind of a, kind of a black on, on them. And they, you can usually tell that it's them because they go down the tree. They don't go up, they go down the tree. And you probably have heard them in the forest. They go yak, yak, yak. If you've heard that call, that's a nuthatch. And they love these old growth forests like this one. All right, now another set of iconic piece, uh, peaks. The Chavano, and by the way, this word is spelled, is pronounced Tabawatch. Tabawatch. So kind of come up this very long, long dirt road that takes you up. It is a, um, it's an erosion feature. Basically, it's the huge alluvial fan created by water erosion coming off the Rockies when the Rockies were first formed. So you get a sense of how high the peaks must have been simply because you're traveling over so many, um, so much sand and you'll notice that the boulders and the little rocks that you go over are very rounded from the water. That's a water uh, feature. So you're gonna come up this road that goes over this, it's a very sandy road, but it's passable to most factory uh, equipped SUVs and all-terrain vehicles. I suppose you could have taken an old fashioned VW bug up there with some uh, careful driving, but I suggest having an all-terrain vehicle to get in here. You can't camp at the trailhead, but there's good camping along the road and also just dropping slightly down out of, uh, through this part of the forest. In any case, you're going to pick up a piece to the Colorado Trail and right through here, you're going through some really lush forests. So you see flowers and you see birds. And then you turn in, make a left, and you're going to start up this, which is a lot drier terrain. You're leaving the, so you're going to start seeing things like wild roses and asters. And you'll notice as the trail is to the side of the uh, uh, trail where the trail, it'd be a road cut, but in this case, it's a trail cut. You can see what you're walking on. And again, it's that massive alluvial fan coming off of Chavano. You're going to get to a certain point where this is the winter route, which is called the Angel of Chavano. But the summer route kind of comes up and around this way. And I'm going to show you this point because I've always found it more useful in guidebooks to show when the photos show the route and not just the summit. The summit doesn't get you there by itself. You want to know how to get there. So I'm going to show you this point right here. Eventually, uh, CFI, the Colorado 14ers Initiative and the Forest Service are gonna move this trail and put it right on this ridge because there's some erosion issues right here. Um, but for now, for right now, if you're doing it in the summer, stay on this trail in the sandy soil, you don't want to be creating more erosion. Additionally, the Forest Service and CFI don't want you to come up to uh, Table Watch this way. They want you environmentally, the most environmentally sound way is to do Chavano first and then walk over Chavano first and then walk over to Table Watch and then come back. 
All right, and when you get up there, you'll understand why this area is especially vulnerable to erosion by human footprints. And when we get thousands of us doing the 14ers every year, uh, human footprints can in fact create a lot of damage. Remember I told you I was gonna show you that one spot on the route. So what happens here, you come off, the, the, the trail actually goes up this way and then you're gonna cut across here and you're gonna get up into this saddle and go that way and the summit's out of view. Those of you who know something about um, botany, especially uh, about trees, will notice that we're looking at a very ancient life form here. One of the few kinds of trees or any plants of any kind that can survive in this um, cold, sometimes very hot, very arid climate with sandy soil. These are the bristle cones. Uh, some of these trees may be thousands of years old. Uh, so when you see them, take uh, some special care not to break off any of the limbs. You may be looking at centuries worth of growth, but do take a look at the cones. The female cones are kind of small and purple and they have little bristles on them, hence the name, name of the trees. I'm gonna go back just one, oops, I'm gonna go back just one here. <clears throat> I didn't finish them, I, I've done Chavano. I've done Chavano and Table Watch, been up there a couple of times actually. But on this day I didn't finish because my dog sat down in the shade and just let me know he was done for the day. Not because he was tired, but because he was very hot. On the 14ers we think about um, getting too cold. On Chavano and Table Watch, you also have to be careful not to get dehydrated because once you break all the way up, it's pretty dry. And on a hot summer day, you're also in that sun. So by the time you get up here, like my dog let me know, you may be dehydrated. And once you're in here, you're gonna get some wind. So be sure to keep your, uh, stay hydrated. And again, an early start is recommended. I talked to you about the bristle cones and now we're down in Salida. So we're down south now. I'm going to talk um, in this order, all right? This is the Monarch Pass Road. If you keep going, you're gonna wind up, if you keep going west, you're gonna wind up in Gunnison. Go east and you wind up Canyon City. Here's Salida, all right? This is Green Creek. It's the first thing I'm gonna talk about. Then I'm gonna talk about the classic way to get into Boss Lake. Another uh, day hike called the Water Dog Lakes. This trail that wraps, oops, where did my cursor go? This trail is part of the Continental Divide Trail. It's one of my favorite hikes in the area. It is also one of the toughest, and we'll talk about that. And then over on the right-hand side, we have the part of the Rainbow Trail with a detour, and then we have the Little Rainbow Trail. So we're gonna start here at Greens Creek. Fortunately, right at the turnoff is also assigned to a winery. So if you have the notion after your hike, you might check them out. Greens Creek Trail, again, you can get to it year round. Most of the year you can hike all the way to the Continental Divide if you so choose. During the winter, you may wanna turn back uh, about Timberline. But in the meantime, in the spring, it's great for wildflowers and uh, uh, if you're into insects and uh, butterflies and uh, dragonflies, they're all around here. And in the fall, you can imagine this place all turned with the aspens and the uh, willows having all turned different colors. Um, so again, again, this is a day hike. Uh, if you want to turn it into a backpack, you could go up to the Continental Divide and do part of the Co Continental Divide Trail or the Colorado Trail from here. Uh, the uh, biggest uh, risks that you're going to have are mountain bikers. You do share this trail with mountain bikers and moose. So beware of the moose. I'm actually more afraid of moose than I am of bears in the backcountry. The other trail that I mentioned was Boss Lake. I suggest for most of you, taking the classic approach um, from the town of Garfield and parking near 
the town. The book describes how to get there. Um, the, optional access, the optional access route, which I also will mention later on, requires a tough four wheel drive uh, to get to. The lake is beautiful, the fishing is good, but it's strictly catch and release because this is one of the places that the Colorado uh, Parks and Wildlife uh, people are trying to recover the endangered native green cut, excuse me, cutthroat green trout. So it's strictly catch and release. It's also the headwaters for the middle fork of the South Arkansas River. So people here call this stream, which eventually becomes a river, the middle fork. And then the South Fork is what flows into Salida, and near Salida, and near Salida is where uh, both the uh, Arkansas River that is up in Buena Vista and Leadville eventually uh, comes together with the South Arc. So right, if you turn around from this point, if you turn and this picture's in the book, you're actually looking down valley and over, and in some seasons, especially the spring, you find um, a, uh, there's a waterfall there. And I am petting my dog here so he doesn't start uh, acting like a four-legged toddler and demanding my attention. So sorry about the distraction. Water Dog Lakes was one of my dog's favorite place, actually. I had to convince him, however, that it was not named after him. Instead, it's named after a kind of native salamander. And the salamander, interestingly, is a bit of a predator because he will, they will eat things like tadpoles and uh, you know, little bait fish. Uh, so they're a strange looking creature. They've got big heads and a, a kind of a uh, fish-like tail. Very strange looking little amphibian. In any case, this, the fir this is a continuously steep trail up here. So while it's short and well-marked, never gets steep in one place, I consider it a moderate trail, not an easy trail, simply because it never lets up until you get to the lake. Great picnic areas around here, um, some good fishing here. The second lake is up in this bench. There's no, no official trail leads there. I went around this way, but I noticed a lot of other people just went counterclockwise to get up here. Um, and beyond here, is the Continental Divide. And I'll get to that next. Oh, if you want to camp in this area, this really rocky on the near shore, near shore, good picnics, but not such great camp, tent sites. So go around to the, the other side where you see these trees and get back in here. There's some level ground uh, 100 to 200 feet away from the lake, legal camping sites uh, out of the wind and um, still with the Still lots of uh, solitude up there. This is the Col uh, Continental Divide Trail and part of the Co Colorado Trail on what they call the Collegiate West uh, op uh, variation. I recommend, strongly recommend, getting up to the old Monarch Pass, main Monarch Pass. The new Monarch Pass is over here. But I want you to get off on the old Monarch Pass and go up around the ski area. Remember I showed you that this is Water Dog Lakes right down here. This is that crest I mentioned earlier. You're going to come across here and turn. Do not miss this turn because you'll end up who knows where. Then you're going to come down this way. So if you do it the way I said, then you're going across the high country, the very exposed terrain in the nice, calm, peaceful morning. And when the thunder bom bombers start to form, you're starting to drop down to the lakes and or to these uh, high altitude tarns, ch -ch 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 -ch, eventually to Hunt Lake, which is in here and around near to Boss Lake. I, you can go back Boss Lake this way and drop down toward Garfield. That is a lot of extra miles. So what I did was come down this way to a fairly obscure uh, access road, which I describe in depth in the book. But the reason I want you to start at Monarch, the old Monarch Pass, and go this way 
is you get through the highest terrain in the morning and you're coming down in the afternoon. If you go the other way, you're climbing into the storms. And that's why of all the trails in the book, I emphasize, please follow the way that I went. It is spectacular. You are up where you can see one, two, three, at least four, no, five mountain ranges in all directions, um, but there is no shelter. I took this picture, by the way, in September. This is what September looks like in the high country. Uh, most people will do this as a backpack. Uh, some long distance hikers might be able to do it in a day, but that's pushing it. Uh, and you're pushing your luck a little bit. So yes, this is one of my favorite trails, partly because of the scenery. And you get these 100 mile vistas. But look where the trail goes. You're following, first I want you to look at this. That is a Karen, these giant Karens. It's well marked. Most of the Colorado Trail is. But there's no shelter. There's absolutely no shelter here. Also, there are several turns where you're turning, going around the ski area or through the ski area or turning off of uh, old, um, actually old Indian trails. So you need to have some good ma um, basic map and uh, compass skills. A GPS would help too, but there's no uh, substitute, I, I believe, for knowing where you are on a map and compass that you, you can instantly uh, and instantly be able to find where you are. This is the descent. All right, now we are going to pick up where the trail is. I'm on the trail here and it goes down and that's the trail. This is why it's easier going down than up. You're gonna spend a lot of time coming up these switchbacks. And as I said, if you're going opposite of what I uh, recommend, you're gonna hit the divide in the afternoon and that's not, um, that's just not good trip planning uh, in any case. So you're gonna come down here and eventually drop down to Hunt Lake and then uh, Boss Lake. There's no good camp. Well, this is, this is a beautiful area, by the way, this Krumholtz zone, very sensitive terrain. But in any case, you're gonna drop down and eventually get to Hunt Lake where there is good camping and then on to Boss Lake. Now we're going further south. We are actually now south of US 50. We, to make the access here, you come off 285 before Poncha Pass and come over, you'll have her, past O'Haver Lake and Campground and come up this very passable, um, mostly gravel, some dirt road up to this point. The key with uh, doing Mount Ure is that you're not on the Colorado Trail and you're not on the Continental Divide Trail. This is the CDT and CT, and they come up over Marshall Pass, Marshall Pass being in here. What you wanna do if you're doing Mount Ure is to come up here and park or camp up in here someplace. We camp kind of up here, but put your back to this um, outhouse. And then you're gonna start walking up. There's a little bit of an old road there and you can start walking up this way. This is my actual track. A lot of people will follow a user trail. There's not an official trail here. So you kind of do a user trail or just go straight up to this point, go along one ridge, take a right and go this way, right? This is that ridge. You can't, again, you can't quite see the summit here, but this is that main ridge. This, it's a bit of a stony spine that you have to maneuver around. I found it easier on the way up to go to the left of the rocks and then on way on down, of course, you're going on the right. There are a lot of, uh, Mount Ure has a lot of loose talus up in here. It's, I say it's loose, it doesn't move much on you, but the ridge is shallow enough that you can't really plunge step down it, but the talus kind of bounces, it's sort of strangely flat rocks. So you can't really run it either. Expect to take more time on the descent than you normally would on a mountain. So give yourself a little extra time coming down this guy. 
any case, it is a very beautiful, again, a very, very beautiful area. And I think um, you'll enjoy just camping maybe the night before and maybe the night after the, um, the climb as well. Now we're going to drop an altitude to trails that are accessible pretty much year round unless it's in the middle of winter after uh, a heavy snow. All right, so Salida doo -doo 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 -doo, is over in here. Salida East, and this is the main part of Salida here. This is a little hamlet of Poncha Springs. So you're going to come up 285. This trail, and that's that's the turnoff, the Haver Lake turnoff to Mount Ure. And now this is the Rainbow Trail. The Rainbow Trail is remarkable. If you keep going, you're going to end up near Westcliff in the Wet Mountain Valley. I only took it to about uh, the uh, Fremont County border. A lot of locals will, okay, this is the Rainbow Trail. This is a detour you may have to take if the Forest Service is working on removing some timber from a fire a few years ago. This squiggly guy is a lot of fun, very close to town and pretty easy, just kind of undulates. This is the little Rainbow Trail. Boom. So the Rainbow Trail is long. Um, locals usually hike it in sections, and there are many places, as you noted on the early, the map on the previous slide, just to get off it or to park a shuttle car. Very easy to follow. Uh, there is one really significant hill, climbs about a, more than a thousand feet on the west side, but for the most part, for a hiker, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you're mountain biking, that's a different question. That's a different issue because it does require technical skills. This is the fire damage on near the east side. Most of the time you can just walk through it um, because the Forest Service has removed most of the debris. It's very somber, generally quiet, except for the woodpeckers. Uh, but you may, if the Forest Service is working on the trail, you may have to take that detour I mentioned. And finally, there's the Little Rainbow Trail. Uh, it is great because it undulates just kind of through this pinion and uh, sage country. I, re rec the only th I recommend um, this trail year round, but as always, generally you're gonna find better weather and uh, a more pleasant time earlier rather than later in the day. And don't you just love Colorado sunsets? Finally, I'm gonna give you a few words about water because the, um, the valley exists and much of the wildlife and uh, human activity exists in the area because of the river. The river is splendid fishing, but do re really respect this water. If you're not an experienced boater, then I suggest that you go with a guide or with, uh, with an outfitter. Um, the first thing is the rivers are very cold. If you fall in and you don't know how to get out or there's somebody who doesn't know how to fish you out of the water, you can get hypothermia in very, uh, just a few minutes. I also want you to please review the rules from Colorado Parks and Wildlife about where you can fish, what you can catch and keep, and what you can uh, have to catch and release. Note that this guy that I was uh, photographing that day, he is a highly experienced kayaker, and he is in full safety gear. He's in a wet uh, a wetsuit. He has his life vest on, of course. He has his helmet on. Uh, he's in a very specialized kayak designed for white water, and that is a white water paddle. And he is um, doing some fancy maneuvering here. White water can be a lot of fun, but you also have to know what you're doing. There are some places on the river where you can just kind of wade in some seasons, and it seems very, very pleasant. But these rivers can change drastically from um, winter to spring to fall. This is what the arc looks like at flood stage. If you don't know what you're doing in that, a rapid like that, it's Beaver Falls uh, near Buena Vista. These things can be deadly, even for people who have some skills. So again, if you wanna try the river, go with an outfitter or a guide, and there are a whole bunch of them in the Salida and BV area. Above all, I want you all to do two things for me. First, I want you to have fun. And the other one is I want you to stay safe. So with that, I've been running off at the mouth and I am going to open up the forum for questions. 
All right. Thank you, Penelope. Um, this is one of my favorite areas of the state, and it was really fun to see your photos. Um, we do have a few questions, and if anybody has any additional questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but one thing that I was wondering is, um, what would be a good hike for people to start with who are new to the area? Well, I would start at two of them. Um, one would be Harvard Lakes, because it's a day hike to a nice destination, and it gets you a little used to going up and down hills and exposes you a bit to things that you'll run into later on. Um, knowing how to pace yourself, knowing what to take, that you've got to have layers and rain jackets and all that. At the same time, you'll be, uh, you, you have a, a pretty good chance of seeing wildlife and birds and that sort of thing. The other might be the um, two others that, that would be you, three. That would be nice. One is the Narrow Gauge Trail, which is on just across Chalk Creek from Princeton, the very easy trail I mentioned. Third would be the Whipple Trail in BV. And the fourth would be the Little Rainbow Trail just south and west of uh, Salida. So I would start on those three, or those four, sorry. Great. Um, how did you choose the trails that ended up going in the book? You've got 25 trails in the in the book, and there are lots of wonderful places to hike in the Upper Arkansas. And uh, did you did anything fun or unusual happen while you were writing the book and doing the field work for the book? Well, there were a couple of things. My dog is about to go crazy because the mailman is going to come. So <laughs> hang on. So. No, you're not doing that. Not tonight, Hitchhiker. I got hold of him. Maybe I can keep him from barking. Um, actually, I had to really whittle it down because, <clears throat> as you said, there are a lot of places I could have put in the book, but I just ran out of room. I uh, sought a mix of easy and more difficult trails, mostly day hikes, because that's mostly what people want to do up there, as well as a few backpacks. In a few cases, I steered clear of trails that I knew that the Forest Service and uh, or Colorado 14ers initiatives didn't want people to go in. I used to have a favorite trail up there called the Agnes Valley Falls. A few years ago, there was a massive rock fall and it killed a bunch of people. The Forest Service doesn't want you going in there anymore. So I haven't been back to that, that area since that tragedy. That's why that one's not in the book. Um, the others I chose there's also a lot of technical climbing uh, up in the BV and, and the Salida areas, but I steered clear of that because it was simply beyond the scope of a hiking guide. Some of the areas have been my favorites. Uh, some of the trails have been my favorites for decades. Pine Creek is an example. Um, others were just iconic, Mount Yale and Mount Huron. So I did have to do some, be a little selective about where I was. And they were, and thus I ended up with a mixture that I thought pe other people would like from beginners to more advanced and also things that I really have enjoyed over the years. Um, great, did, did anything fun or unusual happen while you were writing the book? Did you see, or did you see anything memorable? Well, uh, it's all, there's a lot of memorable things up here. Um, <laughs> On Greens Creek, I didn't get all the way to the Continental Divide this time because there was a moose and I had my dog. And fortunately, my dog was too interested in the squirrels to recognize that the moose was up ahead of us. But I kind of just quietly snuck back out of there because uh, moose dogs don't mix. The moose think that dogs are wolves. And that's another reason to keep your dog on a leash. So that was one. Um, I got, um, not so much on, on uh, let's see, what else happened? I guess uh, one thing that did annoy me on, on um, Mount Princeton was, you know, even if you are in the back country, you're still in the state of Colorado, okay? And so this young woman was coming up the road in a big, huge, lifted pickup truck. I don't know if you know what lift kits are, but they lift the bottom of the truck beyond what it normally should be. And I was coming down this very narrow road and I just kind of held the right away. I didn't step off the side because she was either going to hit me with the big mirrors on the side of the uphill side of the road or potentially push me off the side to the right uh, off the cliff if I gave way. So I 
kind of just held the right away. And as I passed her, she kind of got snarky and said, well, you could have gotten out of the way. And I did not remind her of what Colorado law says about pedestrians and vehicles. I just kind of kept going. What else? Um, I enjoyed seeing some of the mountain bikers because uh, I ride, but not at that technical level. And seeing some of those people handle the rainbow trail was impressive. I was really impressed with that. What else happened? Um, on these hikes, I did not have any extraordinary adventures. I will tell you that the first time I did Chavano, this is many years ago, when I didn't have the dog, I had probably my closest bear encounter. Mm. I was coming down the trail. Now, this is early summer, and I was coming down the trail after doing the hike, and I was kind of tired and not, maybe didn't have the situational awareness I should have. And the bear was coming up the trail, eating the flowers before they bloom. Just before the flowers bloom, they have the most protein in them. So the bear was going along the trail, nibbling at the flowers, and we closed. Now, we probably were at least 50 feet apart. But when you're looking at a big boar, a male bear, and he stands up, 50 feet can seem like five inches. And we stared at each other for a while. And then he, um, I realized I was staring him in the eye, uh, dropped my gaze. And, you know, I was kind of talking to him. Probably, I was swearing, to tell you the truth. Um, and just held my ground. And then when I dropped my gaze, he realized that I was no longer a threat. He came down onto all fours. And it's a myth that bears cannot run downhill. He took off with it. I mean, he just pirouetted and just took off. So do be bear aware up there too. That wasn't yeah. while I was doing the book, but it was a few years ago in exact in this same area. It was not coming off Chavano. Wow. Um, someone wrote, um, I realize that access may be limited, but are there any trails you could recommend on the east side of the Arkansas River? Yeah, um, the east side of the Arkansas is mostly BLM land. It is more for better suited to mountain biking than for um, than for hiking. The Whipple Trail actually is on the east side of the Arkansas and it's in what they call the Arkansas River Hills. A number of trails go off from there. Um, and there also are some trails further north and I'm trying to remember the names of them. But yes, there are trails in there. They're wider. They're going through much drier country and that's, that's mountain biking country. Uh, for the most part. There are a couple places where you can get that are, are uh, reserved for hikers, but that's mostly mountain biking country. Uh, I would start with the Whipple Trail and learn that uh, trail system and then uh, ask the locals. There's another trail that goes uh, off north of Pine Creek, and I'm sorry I'm having brain freeze right now, but it does go up to um, um, an area up there to some historic cabins. Uh, someone wrote, uh, do you have any insight on backpacking the collegiate loop? So I think that would be the yes. Colorado Trail collegiate loop. Okay. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, the Colorado Trail goes from Denver to Durango. It's just under 500 miles, 486 or 487, something like that, if you take the main trail. And the main trail goes east around Twin Lakes. The interlocking loop uh, trail that I mentioned is actually part of that. The collegiate loop instead veers west from uh, Twin Lakes and goes up through the high country joining the Continental Divide Trail. The best two things that I can tell you about it, one is that you do have to have good navigation skills even though it is well marked because it will hold snow much later in the uh, summer and get it earlier in the winter. A lot of it is very exposed, as you saw on the uh, part of the CDT that I, that I talked about. Um, I also recommend coming in from the Lake Ann side to get over Lake Ann Pass because, how do I describe this? Let me, let me go back up here. I'm gonna show, for this person, I'm gonna show something here, okay. Uh, one more. I'm going to actually get up. Okay. Okay. I got to get back to Lake Ann. Sorry. And I'll show you one recommendation that I have on this. 
Sorry, people. Bear with me. Bear with me. Back to the start. Not all the way to the start. <laughs> I want to get you to. No, 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 no. Where's my can? Ah, like Anne. Okay. This is what I wanted to show you. Okay. This is the C, that is the CT and CD. The CT and the CDT are the same through this area, okay? You want to come up, okay, here, here is Clear Creek Reservoir. You want to come this way on it and go, this is Lake Ann. Okay, you want to get up toward Lake Ann because you don't, and go down this. This is Lake, Lake Ann Pass. And it's a series of switchbacks over a really, really loose, rocky area. Going up it, you will take two steps up and one step back. If you go down it, it's a lot easier. And then you're going to drop down into much easier terrain. So one of the recommendations I have in this area is that you do the CT collegiate loop and the CDT north to south through here, if you can do it. If you're hiking it, as a through hike from the boot hill of New Mexico north, the reasons people do that, um, you're still going to hit this. Just know that that's there. So that's that's one of the specific recommendations I have. So the whole loop is about um, 80 miles, I believe. Yes, um, it adds. Mm -hmm. And Colorado Mountain Club Press has a brand new Colorado Trail Data Book Eighth Edition. Um, which has really great information about the whole Colorado Trail, including um, this part of it that we're talking about. So I'll just put this in the chat right now. Also know that the um, Collegiate Loop is less traveled, but there's also reason for that. So I would not say that if you are new to long distance hiking, the regular uh, Colorado Trail on the east side that goes around Twin Lakes is probably more doable. If you are an experienced through hiker looking for more solitude or more of a challenge, then the collegiate loop will be very interesting to you. Yeah, and, and actually I think I misspoke. The entire collegiate loop is about 160 miles. I think it's 80 if, on each side. If you, yes, it's 80 it's, uh, per section, basically. Yes, yeah. And the part that I talked about is just a very small part, again, because you know, trying to do a back, I was trying to get a backpack hike in to the book without um, spending too much page after page after page on it. Yes, that's a, a beautiful loop, um, a really great part of the Colorado Trail. Mm -hmm. um, any last questions for Penelope? Um, if not, I just have one last question, which is, what is your top favorite hike in the book? And what is your dog's favorite hike in the book? <laughs> if you know <laughs> well my favorite yes and I can tell you that for um, my favorite hike is still going up Pine Creek and that's why I beg people to be so careful with their leave no trace etiquette uh, packing out all their trash I ended up packing out other people's trash um, respect the water uh, the rivers that this creek and the uh, ponds don't camp too close to them uh, but that is my favorite hike. My dog is favorite hike is any place that I put the extra long leash on him and let him swim, which includes <laughs> Harvard Lakes and Water Dog Lakes. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Penelope, for sharing all of the, your photos and your insights um, about hiking in the Buena Vista and Salida area. And thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Thanks, folks. And uh, thank you for being interested in my book. All right, with that, um, I'm going to end the presentation and thanks so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, folks.